Um, we have Sam Gelman from the University of Wisconsin-Madison talking today. Um, he is part of the Gitter and Romero Labs here at UW-Madison. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna have his professor, uh, Dr. Anthony Gitter, uh, do a little bit of introduction uh, for both Sam and their project for us. So whenever you're ready, Dr. Gitter, you can go ahead. So thank you very much for having us and Sam to speak about some of his latest work. Uh, my research group at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Morgridge Institute, which is a separate institute physically located at UW-Madison, uh, primarily was working on uh, computational biology with network biology problems and small molecule drug discovery until Sam came along and really was the driver that cemented and formed this collaboration between my group and Phil Romero's group in biochemistry. And ever since then, we've been working with Sam and uh, learning more about how we can use machine learning for protein engineering, learning about the strengths and especially the weaknesses about machine learning to guide protein engineering, uh, some of which you'll, you'll hear about today, some of which Sam has published in the past. And I think he make, makes some brief references to that. And our goals are to both build better machine learning models that are useful for practitioners and also to go out and actually apply those models in our own more collaborative design projects. Uh, we have some enzyme engineering projects that are now active. So uh, Sam is getting close to graduation. So he's very excited to wrap up what he's working on right now and share it with you today. Thank you for the introductions, Tony and Meg. Um, I have been looking forward to presenting this research to this group for quite some time and I'm happy I finally have the opportunity to share uh, what we've been working on so hard on for the last couple of years. So today I'll be talking about mutational effect transfer learning for protein design. Um, as you know, proteins are extremely important for living organisms. Uh, they play vital roles in basically every process in our bodies from speeding up chemical reactions to fighting infections. But proteins also have potential beyond their natural biological roles. And with protein design, we want to create or modify proteins to fulfill new functions. So for example, in healthcare, um, monoclonal antibodies have been designed to help treat COVID. In the environmental sector, the enzyme PEDACE was engineered to break down plastic, which can help with recycling. And in renewable energy, enzymes have been designed to help convert biomass into biofuels efficiently. And these are just some of the real world applications where protein design can have a transformative impact. In our work with protein design, we're interested in optimizing quantifiable molecular properties by introducing mutations to a given wild type sequence. So let's take green fluorescent protein or GFP as an example. Originally found in jellyfish, um, GFP's main function is to emit green light in a process known as fluorescence. And the GFP and engineered versions of it are commonly used as marker proteins in scientific research. And like all proteins, GFP has an amino acid sequence that folds into a distinct 3D structure and the structure determines its function. So in this case, we're looking at brightness. Here we can see that the wild type version has a brightness of 3.7. However, by introducing an amino acid substitution to the sequence, we can alter the protein structure and consequently its function. So some variants might have lower brightness like this one here, which has a brightness of 3.6 and other variants might have brightness that exceeds the wild type like this one. So to visualize the design process, I like to imagine traversing a 3D um, fitness landscape. And each point represents a unique sequence and the height represents function. So in this case, again, brightness. Our goal is to find peaks in the landscape where the function is maximized. 
the challenge with protein design is that there are many different ways to modify protein sequence. And it's hard to know how a particular modification is going to affect function. Now, we can test protein variants in the lab to see how they function, but the space of um, potential mutations is just so big that it's not feasible to test all of them. So this is where machine learning can be helpful. If we can train a model to accurately predict the functional effects of mutations, the model can help guide our search through the sequence space and find variants with high function more effectively. So our objective is to take a set of labeled sequence function examples and use them to train a model that can predict the functional activity of protein variants. And the data for this task could come from high throughput experiments like demutational scanning, or maybe it comes from low throughput um, assays uh, that test a much smaller number of variants. But regardless, each variant in our data comes with an associated functional score, which tells us how well the variant performs a specific function. Um, and usually the variants in our data sets have maybe one to five amino acid substitutions per variant. <clears throat> so I used green fluorescent protein brightness as an example on the previous slide, but the function could be whatever the assay is measuring. So it could be binding affinity, it could be thermostability, um, et cetera. <clears throat> and our goal is to use this sequence to function data to train a neural network. Uh, the network takes amino acid sequences as input and it predicts their corresponding functional scores. So once the network is trained, we can, uh, we can, we can take it and predict the function of new variants that were not experimentally characterized. And hopefully if the model generalizes well, we can get some accurate predictions that'll help us do protein design. So one problem with this setup is that training data can be limited and that can affect the performance and the capability of our models. So some data sets are biased, meaning the mutation space is not sampled randomly. And I'll show you an example of what I mean on the next slide. Um, some data sets are small, so maybe they come from low throughput assays and they only contain tens of variants or maybe hundreds. Um, and new data can be expensive or difficult to acquire, right? So these limitations can make it challenging for the model to generalize, which ultimately affects the practical utility of the models for protein design. And just to give you an example of how data sets can be biased, here's a bar plot showing where mutations occur in the GRB2 abundance data set, which is just one of our data sets. So you can see that some positions are much better represented than other positions. Um, and specifically, this, this data set barely has any examples of mutations in position five. So the question is, if we were to train a model on this data, could we make accurate predictions for position five um, when we don't have any examples to learn from, right? How well can the model generalize from the other positions to position five? Now, the bar plot we just looked at was for the GRB2 abundance data set, but that's just one of the many data sets we're using to evaluate our methods. These data sets cover a variety of different proteins and functions. Um, some of the data sets are quite large, having like tens or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of mutations, um, sorry, of examples. Um, which each example can have multiple mutations. Um, and this is great because we can downsample the data and simulate what it would be like to train with much smaller data sets. So how can we approach modeling these data sets? You might be thinking a straightforward method would be to just split them up into training and testing sets and code the sequences using a one-hot encoding and then train a linear regression model to predict the fitness score 
given the amino acid sequence. And um, I agree, if nothing else, that gives us a very good baseline, right? So up next, I wanna walk you through how this baseline linear regression model performs on a couple of these data sets, specifically GB1, uh, GRB2 abundance, and TAM1 beta lactamase. So here are scatter plots um, that show the performance of this ridge regression baseline. We're using ridge regression, which is L2 regularized uh, linear regression. Um, the, the train set size is around 16,000 examples for GB1 and GRB2, and around 8,000 examples for TEM1. And of course, I'm showing the results for the test set, um, and these scatter plots show the true score on the x-axis and the predicted score on the y-axis, and there is a line of equivalence in red, and of course, ideally, we want to be on that line because that would mean our predicted scores equal our true scores. I've also annotated the plots with the Spearman and Pearson correlation on the top left. So you can see from these plots that ridge regression, despite being a simple additive model, uh, can perform quite well when it's trained using a lot of data. Now, a nonlinear model would perform even better. And if you're interested in seeing the performance of fully connected, sequence convolutional, and graph convolutional networks, you can check out our initial study in this area. And um, here's that reference. Now, training with large data sets is one thing, but a greater challenge is, is when dealing with smaller training sets, right? So here's a plot of ridge regression performance at different training set sizes for the GB1 data set. On the x-axis, we have the training set size, and on the y-axis is the Spearman correlation between the true and the predicted scores. And we want, you know, a, high, a higher Spearman correlation is better. So I'm using the same test set across all the different training set sizes. Now, as we reduce the size of the training set, Spearman correlation starts to drop. And we can look at the scatter plots at points along this curve. And at the highest training set size, this is the scatter plot we saw on the previous slide, uh, we have a model that looks relatively strong, and maybe we could use it for protein design. But when we go down to just 32 training examples, like we might get from like a low throughput assay, um, you can see from the scatter plot that the model is much weaker, and it's mostly just predicting negative three for all the variants or noise around that. Um, and so, so far, we've looked at randomly sampled train and test sets. But we can also design more challenging train and test sets to assess how well the model can generalize when it's presented with um, biased training data. So with we, we've identified four different types of extrapolation that we're testing. And with position extrapolation, we test how well the model can generalize to sequence positions that are not represented in the training data. So ridge regression, when it's trained on these one hot encoded sequences, uh, is actually unable to perform position extrapolation because it doesn't get a chance to learn weights for the unseen positions. Mutation extrapolation is similar to position extrapolation, but instead of withholding entire uh, sequence positions from training, we just withhold select amino acid substitutions. With score extrapolation, we train on variants with scores that are less than wild type, and we evaluate on variants uh, with scores greater than wild type. Um, so, uh, and then finally, we have regime extrapolation, um, where we train on variants with one amino acid substitution, and we evaluate on variants with two or more amino acid substitutions. So these test sets are more challenging and we can see that performance does degrade 
showing there's room for improvement over our ridge regression baseline. So now I'd like to introduce our approach for improving performance when dealing with these limited uh, experimental data sets. So our approach is called mutational effect transfer learning or METAL for short. And the idea is that we want to augment our limited experimental data with additional data from molecular simulations. So I broke uh, our approach down into three steps. And the first step one is to run molecular simulations to generate the pre-training data. Uh, we're using Rosetta to simulate protein variants. Rosetta is a comprehensive protein modeling software suite. I'm sure many of you have heard, of, heard about it or have used it. And uh, we're using it to calculate energy terms for protein variants. Step two is to pre-train a model to predict the Rosetta energy terms. And this gives our models an opportunity to learn about how mutations and sequence positions relate to each other uh, based on the energy terms and, and to learn an internal representation of protein sequences based on that input data and the energy terms. And finally, step three is to fine tune our pre-trained model to predict the exact function that we're interested in, which is the fitness score from the experimental assay data. So what I'd love to do is to go through these steps in a little bit more detail um, and kind of explain how the method works. So because we're simulating our own pre-training data, we can choose what simulations we want to run and what protein sequences we want to include in the training data. So we've identified two strategies called local and global. And these differ in what sequences are included in the training data. So again, we're simulating our own data and we can choose what sequences go in that data. With the local approach, we want to learn a targeted protein representation that works well, uh, that works very well for our protein of interest. And this requires running simulations specifically for that protein. Um, but with the global approach, we want to learn a more general protein representation that would work for any given target protein. Um, the idea here is that, you know, given a new protein, uh, we wouldn't have to run additional simulations. We could just use this global pre-trained model. And uh, with the local approach, the pre-training data only has variants from the protein of interest. Um, with the global approach, the pre-training data has variants from many diverse protein families. And again, the local approach is going to be applicable only to that protein of interest, whereas the global approach is going to be applicable to any given target protein. So simulating data, that's step one of our method, right? Um, let's, let's look at local simulated data first. So again, this is, this is data will support learning a targeted protein representation. And for the local approach, we need to have a target protein in mind. So let's say we ran some experimental assays on GB1. And again, this could be any target protein we're interested in, but let's just say GB1. And now we want to generate some simulated data in addition to the experimental data that we have. So to run Rosetta, we need a protein structure. And conveniently, there is an existing one for GB1 um, in, in PDB. But even when there are no existing experimental structures, we've had success uh, using alpha fold structures. So that is an option. And once we have our target structure and the, and the corresponding sequence, we generate, uh, we generate variants of that sequence 
by randomly introducing amino acid substitutions. Uh, and for, for our local models, we generate 20 million random variants with up to five amino acid substitutions. Um, and then we run the wild type structure and the variants through Rosetta. And what we do is we use Rosetta to modify the wild type structure with the amino acid substitutions we randomly selected. And Rosetta will compute 55 energy terms that capture various aspects of protein stability. The energy terms we're computing um, aren't necessarily modeling the exact phenotype from the experimental assay that we're interested in. But protein stability is important across a range of different phenotypes, and we can run lots and lots of simulations. So finally, at the end of this process, we have our local pre-training data, which contains protein variants of our target protein and the associated energy terms. So again, this data supports learning a targeted protein representation for our protein of interest. Now, the global approach uh, differs in what protein variants we include in the pre-training data. So with the local approach, we generated variants of one target protein, but with the global approach, we're gonna select 150 diverse protein structures from PDB. And here I'm just showing three examples. But the idea is we want to sample wide portions of the protein sequence space by selecting these diverse sequences and structures. And once again, we generate sequence variants of these base proteins by introducing random amino acid substitutions um, with up to five amino acid substitutions per variant. And this time we generate 200,000 variants per base protein. And just like we did with the local data, we're going to compute energy terms for all of these protein variants. Um, and finally, we get our global pre-training data. And this consists of approximately 30 million examples of variants um, from diverse proteins and their associated energy terms. So this, this data is going to support learning a global representation, um, a general representation of uh, protein energies. So once we have our pre-training data, uh, we're going to move on to the next step of the method, which is to actually do the pre-training. And here we're going to train a model to predict the Rosetta energies. We're using a transformer encoder model that's pretty similar to the original transformer introduced in Attention is All You Need with some slight differences. The inputs are amino acid sequences and the outputs are predictions for the 55 energy terms. So this is a multitask network. Uh, we're using a relative position embedding based on the 3D protein structure. This enables the attention mechanism to use relative distances of residues in 3D space as a signal to determine what to pay attention to. And finally, our models are relatively small compared to some of the models you see out there nowadays. Um, we are just using 2 million parameters for our local models and 20 million parameters for our global models. So through this process of pre-training, our model is going to learn how mutations and sequence positions relate to each other based on the energy terms. And it's going to learn an internal representation of protein sequences based on the energy terms. So the final step of our approach is to transfer the learned representation um, to experimental data and go from predicting energy terms to predicting the fitness score instead of the energy terms. Now in the previous step, we trained this neural network to predict Rosetta energy terms. Um, and now we're going to use a transfer learning process called fine tuning, where we first make a copy of the source model 
and then we chop off the top layer, which was uh, specific to predicting those Rosetta energy terms. And instead, we're going to add a new layer that will be specific to predicting the experimental fitness score. So we use a dual phase fine tuning strategy where we first train the new top layer, but keep all the other weights in the network frozen. And then we unfreeze all of the weights and we train the entire network at a reduced learning rate. So the inductive bias and the knowledge transferred over from the source network is going to help us generalize more effectively from less experimental data, um, as I'll show you shortly. But before we move on to the results, I want to take a moment to address protein language models. And if you've been paying attention, you may have seen some similarities between metal and protein language models like ESM. So these are both retrained models that can be fine tuned to predict fitness scores, but there are several important differences between metal and protein language models. So first is the data source. Protein language models are usually trained on these large databases of naturally existing sequences in Uniprot. Um, on the other hand, metal is trained on simulated data from Rosetta, which includes protein sequences that might not appear in nature. Right, we're just introducing a random amino acid substitutions. Next is the data coverage. Um, protein language models cover the global protein sequence space, whereas metal covers the local and global sequence spaces. Um, in terms of supervision, protein language models are typically trained with masked amino acid prediction or something like it. And metal is trained on energy term prediction. Uh, next, we have the types of examples. So protein language models are modeling the class of naturally fit proteins because that's what's in Uniprot. Um, whereas metal, um, the metal training data includes high scoring and low scoring examples. Um, and finally, ultimately, the underlying signal in protein language models is evolutionary fitness, um, whereas the underlying signal in metal is the Rosetta energies, um, which again are, are related to protein stability and these, this, these biophysical models that Rosetta has. So I want to start off showing a couple instances where metal performs impressively well. <laughs> I've, I've shown these plots before with just the ridge regression baseline, but now I've added metal local and metal global and ESM2. So ESM2 is a state of the art protein language model. Um, here I'm using the 35 million parameter version of ESM2 um, and it does get quite high. I think they have uh, versions with billions of parameters, but um, those are very hard to fine tune. And I, I, so I fine tune this, this model here, the ESM 35 million parameter model, uh, using the same approach that I used for fine tuning metal models. So this result is for the green fluorescent protein data set. And as you can see, metal local performs very well across the different training set sizes. Um, looking at the extrapolation results on the right, uh, we've discussed how a ridge regression is unable to perform position extrapolation when trained with one hot encoded sequences. Um, the other models can perform position extrapolation to varying degrees with metal local outperforming metal global and ESM2. Um, same thing for mutation extrapolation. Score extrapolation proves to be quite difficult for some data sets. And if you recall, this is, this is the type of extrapolation where we train on variants that uh, have scores worse than wild type. And then we predict on variants with scores that are greater than wild type. So metal local 
does slightly outperform the other models tested here, but really none of the models are doing great for score extrapolation. And finally, uh, regime extrapolation is testing um, uh, with training on, on single mutation variants and predicting on multi-mutation variants, and Metal Local has an advantage over the other models. And Metal Global and ESM2 are performing about the same. So GB1 is another example data set where Metal performs quite well. Although the differences between the models are not as big as they are with GFP. Um, and uh, you could see that ESM2 actually catches up to the, the performance of Metal Local um, right around here in the middle of the chart. Um, and looking at he looking at the extrapolation results, we have score extrapolation is a little bit better than GFP. Um, Metal Local is doing pretty good for position extrapolation, and uh, really all the models are doing good for mutation and regime, maybe except for Ridge. Um, and here are the results for the TEM1 beta lactamase data set. Metal Local once again performs impressively well for this data set. Um, ESM struggles a bit with the smallest training set sizes, but it, then it catches up and, and actually starts to slightly surpass Metal Local um, at the largest training set size, although it's hard to see um, because this graph is kind of small. Um, and uh, ESM2 also slightly outperforms Metal Global with mutation extrapolation. I mean, it about matches Metal Local. So that was an in-depth look at some of the best performing data sets that we've tested on. Um, but here are the results for nine data sets we're using. Um, there are some data sets where Metal does not perform as well. And at the top right, I just want to point out, we have these DLG4 and the DLG4 2022 data sets. These data sets are both evaluating the same protein and the same function. Um, so this, this protein is PSD95, and the, the experimental assay is measuring binding to crypt, which is its ligand, um, and our binding partner. And um, with the original DLG4 data set, uh, none of the models really performed that well. Um, but with DLG for the 2022 version, um, we see that all the models are performing better and Metal Local offers a slight advantage at the very smallest training set sizes um, before ESM2 catches up and actually surpasses it. So you may be wondering why two data sets that are measuring the same protein um, and the same function have such different modeling performance. And there are a lot of uh, overlapping variants between these two data sets, meaning um, they, they tested the same sequences. So we looked at the correlations between the true scores of these two data sets, and we've seen that they're not as well correlated as you would expect, given that they're testing the same thing. So that led us to believe that maybe there's some noise in the data, or maybe in the assay that's used to measure the experimental function for the, the original data set. So the take the really the takeaway for me from this is that the quality of the data is important for achieving strong modeling performance. Um, and hopefully that's also gives you enough time to kind of scope out some of these other uh, data sets and how these various models perform on them. So one of the more challenging aspects of modeling proteins is predicting epistatic interactions. It's relatively simple to combine amino acid substitutions additively, but it's much more challenging to be able to predict when two amino acid substitutions will interact right, with one another to produce a, a protein variant that's either better or worse than expected. So we asked the question of 
whether we can predict epistasis if we don't observe any interactions in the experimental training data. Um, in other words, uh, the, the experimental training data only consists of single substitution variants, okay? There are no double substitution variants in the training data here. Um, thus, there's no examples of interactions between amino acid substitutions. So looking at the GB1 data set, we calculated epistasis for all of the double mutation variants. And the GB1 data set has a nearly complete coverage, by the way, of all possible double mutants. So this is a great data set to explore epistasis. Um, we then discretized the epistasis values to negative, neutral, or positive by using a threshold of one standard deviation. Um, and we tested two models, metal local with a random initialization, meaning no pre-training. So on the left, we have um, a, a metal local architecture, but no pre-training, just randomly initialized and then trained on singles only. Um, and on the right, we have uh, the, the fully the pre-trained and transfer learning metal model. So the, the, on the left, the confusion matrix is showing um, performance of metalocal with random initialization. Again, uh, on the y-axis, we have the, the true epistasis, um, either negative, neutral, or positive. And on the x-axis, we have the predicted epistasis, again, either negative, neutral, or positive. So what this confusion matrix is showing us is that when the variant truly exhibits negative epistasis, the randomly initialized model will predict it has neutral epistasis 81% of the time. And if we go down to the last row, when the, the variant has truly positive epistasis, it's basically a coin flip, uh, whether the model will predict neutral or positive epistasis. But when we look at the scatter plot, or I'm sorry, the uh, confusion matrix on the right. Um, this is the metal local model with pre-training. Um, and the main difference is that when the variant is truly positive, metal local will predict it has positive epistasis correctly most of the time. So, um, Considering that, you know, there, there were no examples of epistasis in the experimental training data here, this is quite impressive. And it shows that it shows that the pre-training is conferring a benefit, right, to predicting epistatic interactions. And of course, this could be very useful for designing protein variants, um, which is something that we're trying to do. <laughs> we are uh, looking at taking our metal local models trained with very few sequence function examples and designing a GFP variant in the lab. Um, and Bryce is leading that project along with Chase uh, in Phil Romero's lab. But uh, we don't have results for that yet, so that's coming soon. Um, and actually, we're hoping to put out a preprint later this year, so you'll be able to read all about it um, uh, when it comes out. So th that's that concludes my talk. Um, just to recap, I, I presented mutational effect transfer learning, or METAL. Um, it's a method for predicting qualitative protein function, sorry, quantitative protein function, quantitative. Um, <laughs> The, uh, for, for fitness-based protein design by uh, pre-training and transfer learning from molecular simulations. This method sort of bridges the gap between traditional biophysics-based methods and machine learning approaches because we are training models on these biophysical simulations. And METAL substantially outperforms one state-of-the-art protein language model um, for certain data sets. But there's also a lot of room for improvement. And um, this is something I'm really excited about because if we can have more accurate 
simulations uh, that more closely resemble the experimental phenotypes that we're interested in. For example, we can simulate binding um, if our experimental assay has to do with binding. Um, and that should, or I expect that to improve performance because then we'll have a um, much more similar targets in the source and the uh, transfer models. And of course, there's improvements we can do with modeling. So I want to acknowledge everyone who contributed to this project, including my co-authors, um, the Romero Lab, uh, the Center for High Throughput Computing, and the Gitter Lab. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions now. And if you have additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out. Here's my email. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I can go ahead and read out some of the questions that we got in the chat throughout the talk, if that's okay. And then you can answer them one by one. Um, so our first question was, would using LORA help you uh, help allow you to fine tune larger ESM fold models? And have you like explored that using like LORA, LORA, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but yeah. Yeah, I, I have to admit I'm not familiar with that, but I'm very curious now to look into it. I, I know that um, you can fine tune larger ESM models, or sorry, just larger models in general, because it's done with natural language processing. Um, for us, it was kind of a matter of the, our access to GPU resources and, and time. Um, but uh, I also, I think that they, the larger ESM models probably do offer better performance. Um, so that would be interesting to explore in the future for sure. Um, I will point out that the ESM model I tested here was the 35 million parameter model. It's, it was actually larger than any of the metal models that I tested. So for us, the, the metal global model was just 20 million parameters. Awesome, okay. Uh, the second question that I have here in the chat asks, have you tried shuffling the sequence energy pairs during pre-training to see how much predicting Rosetta scores matters versus how much the benefit comes from taking a few steps with gradient descent regardless of the label to predict? Oh yeah, that's a great idea. We haven't done that particular probe of um to see how how important the actual Rosetta representation is versus how important it is just to have a good initialization, right? Um, but we have looked at a couple of other things that might point us to, uh, to an answer. So we have seen that when Rosetta has a strong correlation with the... Um, experimental function, then we get better performance when we do the transfer learning. So for example, um, for GFP, Rosetta actually has a fairly good correlation on its own for, uh, for correlating with the experimental assay scores. Um, and same thing with TEM1, uh, the Rosetta correlations were quite good. And those are some of the models where our transfer learning performed the best. And that kind of suggests that it's not just the good initialization. It's also the fact that we are learning something useful from the Rosetta energies. Um, but I definitely think that what you suggested there is a great baseline. Awesome. Uh, there was a question if the t training data um, used is available publicly. Um, I can let you speak to that. It seems like the speaker kind of said that they'll have a preprint coming out later in the year. They're also used some known data sets um, like the GB1 data set. Was there anything else you wanted to add to that, uh, Sam? Yeah, that's right. So uh, all the data sets we used, um, the experimental data sets are publicly available. Um, and I'm happy to share references for you, by the way, if you want to send me an email. Um, as far as the Rosetta data goes, right now our plan is to make it available. So just keep an eye out for when we do the preprint later this year. Awesome. And then our most popular upvoted question so far is how expensive are the Rosetta simulations themselves? 
Aha. Very, very keen. Um, so Rosetta simulations can be pretty expensive. And one of the things we're trying to do is to figure out the, the cost trade-off between running more experiments in the lab versus running more simulations to do more pre-training. Um, so for us, we've used, I think, uh, something like 100 million compute days or something. I, sorry, I don't have the exact number, so I don't want to say the wrong thing. But when we, suffice it to say, we couldn't have done it without um, high throughput computing and specifically the open science grid. I um, mean, it, and it has taken quite a bit of compute hours and that would be pretty expensive if you're paying for it through like Amazon AWS. That said, um, we ran a lot of simulations kind of partly because we wanted to see how, ma how many we need to, to get good pre-training performance. And it turns out you may not need that many simulations to get pretty good pre-training. Um, and that would mean that, hey, you don't really have to run that many simulations, even though they are expensive. Um, it, would, it would save a lot of time and money. But also we are looking at two approaches, right? We have the local approach, which performs the best um, and requires running your own simulations. But we have also the global model, which is more analogous to protein language models where, yeah, we run the simulations and pre-train the model, but then you can apply that model to any protein without needing to run additional simulations. Um, so if you don't have the resources um, or you just don't want to, that is an option. Um, we're also, we've also thought about, although we haven't tested, maybe taking the the global model as a base and fine tuning that with a very small number of targeted simulations. Um, and then kind of, kind of uh, that way we can not have to run as many local simulations, but uh, we have not tested that yet. So hopefully that um, answers the question. Awesome. Uh, so the next question that I have here asks, how much does the performance of the models depend on the accuracy of the predicted structures from AlphaFold? Also, how much of the energy and other physical calculations depend on the structures and the downstream model performance? Right. So. I think for most of our data sets, we used experimental structures, but there were at least two, maybe three, where we used alpha fold structures. And as far as I can tell, they performed just as well, uh, or at, at least uh, I couldn't directly pinpoint, you know, any performance differences back to the original structure that we used. Um, I think what had mu a much greater effect in those cases was just um, how well the Rosetta energies correlated with the experimental assay and also um, uh, yeah, yeah, that, I, I think that's the main thing. So I would be curious to explore that in the future, but for now, yeah, all, all I can really say is that the alpha fold structures that we tried worked pretty well. Awesome. The next question I have um, asks, have you tested a baseline where you simply concatenate the Rosetta energy features to your encoding? Um, also, have you tested not on linear model baselines on one hot encoding and ESM2 encodings. Have I tested a baseline where I simply concatenate the Rosetta energy features to our encoding? Okay. And have I tested nonlinear model baselines on one hot encodings and they seem okay, yes. So we have tested all kinds of 
um, baselines, which include the Rosetta Energies, um, and we've also tested um, feature extraction, where we just kind of take the the output from the ESM internal layer and train a linear model on top of that. Um, so I'm trying to remember if I've ran these specific baselines or not. Um, but regardless, what we ended up seeing with the baselines that we ran that kind of included the Rosetta Energy features, um, it did not perform as well as actually fine tuning. Um, and we found that fine tuning was was key to, to achieving this really strong performance that we're seeing. Uh, and when we just used the features as uh, as um, features um, in like a linear regression model, um, that did not perform as well. Okay. Uh, the next comment and question I had um, here says, your models perform well at predicting stabilities and energies of new variants that give that you get, but could you run things in reverse so that the models tell you what variants are predicted to improve fitness or improve fitness over some given amount? This was a question from Ron, if you wanna mm -hmm. scroll up and reread it since it's multifaceted. Let's see here, I could you... Yeah, so um, I guess it depends if we're looking at the source models, the, the pre-trained models that are predict, that are that are uh, trained to predict the Rosetta energies, or are we looking at the the transfer models that are have been fine-tuned to predict experimental functional scores? So with the latter. Um, the way we use those models for protein design is actually to search over the space of um, possible protein variants and find the ones with high function um, using some, some type of optimization algorithm like simulated annealing. Um, and the gist is that we kind of start putting in a bunch of variants and see what performs the best according to the model. Um, now there, there are probably model interpretation techniques out there that can kind of take a different look at what the model has learned and try to figure out, um, what, uh, you know, try to extract some kind of knowledge from that about what makes the, what the model thinks makes variants, uh, functional and, Go from there, but yeah, we have not looked at those yet. Awesome. Just a couple more um, if we get through it before time. Uh, one that got upvoted um, asked, um, uh oh, oh, how did you select the proteins for the global model? Ah, yes. So we wanted to select diverse proteins to get good coverage of the global protein space. Um, and we actually looked at a previous reference um, that had published a list of 150 diverse proteins. The reference is Kashiolek and Jones are the authors, um, but I would have to look up the um, the title of the publication. So if you send me an email, if you're curious, but yeah, that, that came from a, a publication where they had done some methodology to pick diverse structures. Awesome. And then another question was for the local predictions, how diverse is your pre-training in Rosetta? Um, can you comment on the diversity of your examples? Are they point mutants, homologs, um, chimeras? What type of diversity do you have? And this question was from Paul, if you want to scroll up and also read it since it has two questions in one kind of. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Um... I see it. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, 
yeah, the, the local pre-training data is, <clears throat> it's based off of a single um, like base sequence. Um, and what we do is introduce <clears throat> amino acid uh, substitutions to, to create variants of that base sequence. Um, we, we do random amino acid substitutions and we go up to five, five amino acid substitutions per variant. So it's not just single mutations. Um, and we actually have an algorithm that I didn't talk about, but it, it, uh, the, the way we sample those random variants attempts to capture, like not just a five, if we're, if we're going to capture a five mutant variant, we also want to have the, the corresponding four mutant variants and the three and the two mutant variants that make up that five mutant variant because we're trying to kind of um, create the data set to have examples of epistasis and interactions. And that's the best uh, possible or not best possible, but that's just the, the one way we thought of that could, that we could do that. Um, but yeah, we have not looked at uh, very diverse local pre-training data. Um, and it, it would be interesting to see how that might improve the pre-training performance of those local models. Um, I think we might still try something like, um, instead of just using one base sequence, we can use a couple different sequences from the family and create point mutants of those. Um, and that will give us like a slightly more diverse local pre-training data set, but we haven't, we haven't done anything like that yet. And just the final question um, that kind of goes off of that, um, someone had asked, um, what is the sequence similarity overlap between the training set and the test set, if you happen to that knowledge to share? Yeah, um, I'm assuming this is asking about the experimental data sets. Um, but I we uh we just randomly split them into training and test sets for the um for, for those learning curves that you saw so there are no like direct sequences that are the same between both the training and testing sets um and then for the extrapolation we specifically crafted the training and testing sets to be very challenging where there was no overlap in um, various ways. Um, and then for the Rosetta data, we we just did, um, we don't really use the test set. I mean, I, I look, I've looked at the test set performance. Um, and by the way, the, the Rosetta models can predict the Rosetta energies pretty well. But uh, with the Rosetta models, we're mainly just interested in learning a representation. So um, the train sets were randomly sampled from the, uh, like the, all the Rosetta data that we generated. Awesome. Well, I would like to thank everybody, um, who's still here just for sticking around for the questions. Sorry that, uh, I had us a little bit over time, but we just had a lot of very interesting questions today. Thank you again to Sam, as well as Dr. Gitter for speaking and giving an introduction. Um, and I, I would encourage everybody, if they have any other questions, to email Sam about his um, work at the email he has listed on the slides. Um, we will be taking a slight break um, in our seminar series for the summer, so we'll have more information about that going out in an email as well as Twitter. Um, but we are looking for people who would like to speak as soon as we start back up um, around the September timeline. So if you have any interest in speaking, uh, please email us at our Gmail account and let us know. Other than that, thank you guys so much for attending today.